Good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here to contribute to and learn from the conversations around cluster. I have enjoyed the session yesterday as well as the session this morning and looking at new and different perspectives for clusters. The Research Triangle region is about a 60-mile um, radius around um, RDU International Airport and the Research Triangle Park itself which is a 7,000 acre science park, the largest in the United States. And we have been doing clusters since 2002. And you can see on the screen that we have 11 focused clusters. Um, these are the clusters that are knowledge-based and center around our strengths, where we're global leaders or have the potential to be. So you can see that these clusters, if you can see it from where you're sitting, center around life sciences and different aspects of life sciences, IT and clean technology and we will talk a little bit about how we've leveraged these 11 clusters since 2002. We believe that our cluster approach to growing our economy, we are an economic development organization and we believe that a cluster approach has contributed to prosperity for all of our citizens, both rural and urban. And we'll look at why we, how we have validated that belief over the last few years. We track our clusters. Um, we do clusters in five-year plans, and we are just finishing our second five-year plan. Now, you can see from the slide that in tracking our announcements and investments of the 11 clusters that you saw on the previous slide, knowledge-based clusters, 68% of the new jobs in our region have come from our clusters, and 82% of the investments made by industry over the last five years, and it will be five years actually on June 30th of 2000. 2014, 82% of these investments have come from our clusters. So we are constantly measuring whether we are achieving success within our clusters and whether our clusters are the right clusters. And of course, by measuring this, we are constantly looking at how many jobs and how much investment have come from these clusters. We believe that clusters helped us weather the recession. We believe that an intentional um, clusters drives intention towards diversity. It's really easy as an economic developer to really be intoxicated by success um, and the latest success, but it's very important that you nurture all 11, in our case, of the clusters that are, we believe are the foundations for job growth and investment in our region. So we believe that that intentional diversity, which is created by clusters, um, helped us weather the recession. And you can see that we were one of the last economies in the U.S. to go into the recession. In 2009, we went with enthusiasm into the recession. By the way, that was my first year of work, so I was wondering what in the world um, I had done. Um, we set a goal for our five-year plan to create 100,000 net new jobs during that five-year period. And in the first year of the plan, we lost over 38,000. So I went to my CEO and said, mm, do we want to adjust this metric? And he said, no. You just have to create 138,000 jobs now. So that was truly his response. And so you can see that we actually had one really bad year, and we battled back. We believe that by June 30 of this year, the numbers look as though we will have met our goal or very close to 100,000 net new jobs. We also have seen a 2.6 increase in regional economic employment growth compared to a national average of down 1%. And in the last decade, five of those years being very challenging, we have seen a 71% growth in GDP. Now, we believe a cluster approach um, is necessary as our resources as an economic development organization have diminished and, and we're running leaner than ever. We believe that clusters give us an opportunity to target our resources and manpower and funds to marketing our region and growing our region with the highest probability of success in creating jobs and investment for our citizens. And we use something called the triple helix economic development growth model within our clusters. And you can find a lot of information about this on our website and just by doing Google. Triple helix is simply put making sure that we all play well together. But in the theory of, um, and out of respect for the academics that created this, it is really bringing in all cases and in a very intentional way academia, government, 
and industry to the table together to meet challenges and solve problems. We believe that not only do you meet challenges and solve problems, but that that's where innovation occurs and where we really can create a change in our economy. So we practice Triple Helix. The very first example of Triple Helix in our region was the Research Triangle Park itself. And for those of you who don't know that story, in 53 years ago when the park was created, North Carolina was second, was 49th in the country in socioeconomic indicators, and that was towards poverty and a lack of um, workforce development and talent. As we have seen 53 years, to get, 53 years later, the Research Triangle Park was created using Triple Helix Economic Development Growth Theory, and it's kind of in our DNA now. We've seen it work, we know it works, so we live it. We also made up a word. We like this word and we live this word within our clusters, collaboration. And we believe that it, especially there's no time in the United States economy that it is more critical for companies, universities, and organizations to learn how to partner and to learn how to compete. So we believe collaboration within clusters is key. Helping guide companies toward collaborating and competing in a healthy way is essential not only to our region's growth, but to the company's growth and the company's survival. We always ask two questions with our clusters when we shape their program of work. We're very intentional about facilitating that work. Yesterday, someone on the stage during Ted Abernathy's panel said that you need a managing director that really is a professional at facilitating um, success to continue to see success within a cluster, and we believe that. We believe that a program of work for clusters is basically you're asking the industries to help you answer two questions, and that is what opportunities are there that are best leveraged together? What opportunities do you as a company have where strategic partnering will help enable your success? And number two, what keeps you up at night? What problems are best solved collaboratively as an industry, as a cluster, rather than as individual companies? So we ask those two questions and we kind of use the answer to those questions to guide and direct the work of the cluster. We believe that the benefits of clusters, and this is something that um, I was listening to the panel earlier, we actually intentionally make industry the loudest voice in our triple helix room. We believe that industry has the answers to the questions that we asked before, and we believe that the triple helix approach to clustering can help them solve problems, meet challenges, and create opportunities in new markets. We also believe that clusters are helping the Research Triangle region transform from an industrial economy to a collaborative economy. What we mean by that is we believe that in the past, and I come from the industrial economy, we believe that in the past individual companies worked very hard to make things and to use their supply chain and value chains to do that in a cost-effective and successful manner. We believe that the future is about networking, connecting, and collaborating. And we believe that clusters are going to be one of the greatest drivers in transitioning from an industrial economy to a networked or collaborative economy. We also believe that clusters engage many, many stakeholders in the ecosystem to the benefit of all. And serendipitously, I received an email right before I got up on stage from one of my cluster companies who just joined a cluster, the clean tech cluster, who listed nine benefits that they have received since they joined the cluster, all having to do with connecting with nonprofits, other partners in the supply chain, and with our universities. We also believe, and this is very critical to a cluster, that sharing challenges and sharing successes and opportunities creates passion. It creates excitement. It is a soft, you know, we look at, I'm an economist, we look at macroeconomic indicators all the time, but you cannot measure what passion creates and what enthusiasm creates. It leads to innovation and ultimately as an economic developer, the goal of creating wealth and prosperity for our citizens. So we believe in the triple helix. Um, you can, we believe in keeping our eye on all three of those. It's very easy to get out of balance, so we believe in being very intentional and tested about that. 
and we believe in cross-pollination. One of the greatest benefits we've seen in our cluster work is helping clusters connect with other clusters, helping smart water connect with smart grid, helping cybersecurity defense companies con connect with electricity providers to, as the grid becomes smarter, the need for security becomes greater. So cross-pollination is a great opportunity for cluster work. And this really should have been a country music band. I was not being for, I wasn't being thoughtful at all when I put a jazz band in there. But we believe that clusters bring all the players on stage to create a beautiful sheet of music which helps everyone in the ecosystem accomplish its goals of moving forward and creating more wealth for all of the players in that ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope some of you had the chance to sample some of the music here in Nashville uh, yesterday evening when you went uh, when you went out. Leanne, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so you, you mentioned you're also in charge of uh, the clean energy uh, cluster. Is working with that cluster any different than working with your established clusters, or are you following pretty much the same model? I think um, working with an emerging technologies, disruptive technologies clusters, has great challenges and great opportunities. Um, one of the greatest challenges is knowing who's there. Um, our cluster is growing very quickly. We have 60% um, more smart grid companies than we had two years ago. Um, and also helping, so keeping track of the growth in an emerging um, cluster is a challenge, but it also gives um, great opportunities for connecting people. Right, right. So a more dynamism, more change that you have to have to deal with. Yeah. Now, uh, Neil, you've uh, uh, also been engaged with energy. You worked with a number of clusters, but I know you worked with a nuclear cluster, so mm -hmm. we'll, uh, may maybe there are some, some lessons that uh, can be applied. But please Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the New Carolina uh, effort and, and what you have done. Okay. Thank you. I get to lean over in advance uh, from up here. So I'm from South Carolina. Uh, uh, we're big college football fans down south. A lot of times when I talk about competitiveness in South Carolina, I, I start with talking about college football, but I've got uh, panelists up here from Michigan, uh, from Georgia, North Carolina, and last night Ted Abernathy and I already had a disagreement over the South Carolina Clemson game coming up in three weeks, so I just I decided not to go there. Uh, I'm going to talk about New Carolina, uh, about our story, and uh, just begin with how we got started. Uh, in 2003, we had a new governor, a new secretary of commerce. We hired Michael Porter to come help us with the strategic plan in the state. Uh, out of that, we launched the South Carolina Competitiveness Initiative, and the South Carolina Council for Competitiveness was formed, rebranded as New Carolina. Uh, New Carolina was uh, made up of the governor, secretary of commerce, president of three research universities, and first and foremost, the mission of New Carolina was to find, build, and celebrate clusters. So what success stories have we had over the last 10 years? We actually manage four clusters. Uh, there are 15 different cluster initiatives underway around the state. Uh, uh, the four that we're managing are the TDL cluster, the Council, the uh, Transportation Distribu Distribution Logistics Council, uh, the Recyclonomics uh, Cluster, Recyclonomics SC. We have 450 uh, uh, companies in that space in South Carolina. This one's anchored by Nucor and Sunoco. Uh, it's SC, which is the Insurance Technology Cluster. This is a regional cluster based in Columbia, focused on writing uh, insurance uh, software for companies all over the world. Uh, uh, and finally, our, our newest cluster, the South Carolina Aerospace uh, Cluster, that's anchored by Boeing. South Carolina was the first state outside of Washington uh, to get a manufacturing plant from Boeing. There are many other clusters, uh, or, or at least entities in the state now, that uh, relate themselves to clusters. And 10 years ago, nobody wanted to use the word cluster in the state, and, and some still don't like to use this word, but uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of these entities associating themselves with New Carolina and associating themselves with the concept of cluster-based economic development. So what have we learned? 
and I'll just hit on a few of these. Of course, the first is engaging uh, uh, key leadership, both at the CEO level and the mid level. Uh, if you don't get an early champion on board, it's just it's just not going to work. Uh, and you've got to have both CEO level uh, involvement to get credibility, but you've got to have other folks from companies involved to do the work. Uh, second, working with key key government officials, and best example uh, for this one is our Transportation Distribution Logistics Council. That one was not going to work without the Secretary of the Department of Transportation and the President and CEO, CEO of our Port Authority uh, uh, working along with us. So we brought together those two plus the Secretary of Commerce and 27 private sector companies in, in uh, Transportation Distribution Logistics to make that cluster work. The third is uh, for clusters to start, you really do have to have a rallying point. I mean, what's that one most important thing that we're going to focus on right now? Uh, for TDL, it was the opening of the Panama Canal. This was going to create a huge opportunities for port cities uh, with these new post-Panamax ships that were going to be able to come directly from Asia through the Panama Canal to the East Coast. South Carolina uh, wanted to be one of the first states to be uh, able to take those ships in, in its naturally deep port. So you, you got to have a rallying point for these to work. Dedicated staffing. Somebody mentioned that earlier. You know, a lot of times cluster efforts start with volunteers. That works for a couple of years. Uh, th but this really is, uh, it's not a part-time job. Uh, so we found that clusters that have access to some uh, dedicated staffing tend to work better. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been interesting is clusters uh, enjoy working with each other. Uh, and I, I talk about TDL a lot, but if you think about, uh, especially our manufacturing clusters in South Carolina, they're all connected to logistics. And so they really enjoy the opportunity to get together and identify cross-cutting issues that they can work on. So that's, uh, that's been something that's worked for us. Um, Reaching out to traditional uh, industry recruitment agencies. You know, when New Carolina started, we said, you know what, the old way of economic development doesn't work anymore. That was a huge mistake. We had Darla Moore, uh, who, who was the leader of this effort in South Carolina, stand up on stage and tell all the traditional economic developers that they're going to be dinosaurs. That is not the way to get started. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to frame cluster development uh, in the context of, of all economic development. So existing industry. Uh, traditional recruitment, startup support. Um, and finally, task forces, um, uh, creating task forces that work across cross-cutting issues like K-12 education, workforce development, uh, your innovation system in the state. So that's another strategy that's worked well for us in South Carolina. So challenges that we are still facing. The first is metrics. Uh, you know, cluster developments, long-term stuff, uh, economic, economic de developers um, uh, traditionally want to measure everything in jobs and economic development. So much of what's important uh, with cluster development is collaboration and communication uh, and connecting people. So how do you how do you measure that, and and how do you how do you get uh, how do you get the argument across that you're not just getting together and having a bunch of meetings? Um, uh, so that 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 is a is a huge challenge for us still. Uh, the second attitude and uh, opinion of key political leaders. Number one, just having cluster-based economic development accepted as a, as a valid uh, economic development strategy. Um, a lot of, um, uh, especially Republican legislators, and we have a strong Tea Party element in, in our state, they view cluster-based economic development as, as picking winners. So you have to get, you have to get beyond that. Maintaining energy and enthusiasm, and we've heard about this, and we heard the 10-year uh, rule, I believe, last night. And, uh, um, it, of course, that's tough. You know, it's always easy to start new things. Uh, it's a lot harder to keep them going after three, four, five, six years. And so uh, that, that continues to be 
uh, a challenge for us. And finally, finding a sustainable business model. New Carolina had some state funding for its first two years. Uh, for the next uh, seven years, it was completely private sector funded. We had one uh, huge uh, comp or one huge supporter, private sector company that was really passionate about it, that, that kept this going. But, but we were funding all of our efforts based on contributions from companies that were participating in clusters. That's not easy. Companies are willing to pay for uh, something that they get directly. They're less willing to pay for uh, economic development for the broader good. I mean, there's only so many checks that they can write to do that. They do it already with the chamber and others. And so uh, it, it is important to have state and other economic development funders at the table. The New Carolina model that's worked uh, starts with private sector investment in clusters uh, and then draws uh, public sector match from the state and finally uh, is supplemented by uh, federal programs uh, that, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, New Carolina has been involved in multiple EDA programs so the, the, the uh, federal sector programs are very hard in helping us uh, fund what we're doing. So that's the New Carolina story. Uh, uh, that's what we've learned. Those are the challenges we're still facing. Great. Thank you, Neil. So, so I mentioned already that uh, Neil and his organization is part of now our uh, EDA-sponsored uh, cluster mapping project. So for those of you who are interested on our website, uh, clustermapping.us, there is a case study uh, that goes into more depth. There's also an HBS case that tries to learn a little bit from the experience. Uh, now, now, many issues that I want to come back in the broader discussion, especially the one on picking winners. You know, how do you select the clusters that you work with? How, uh, uh, but... Um, Right now, just a, a different question for you. So you were the new kid on the block. I mean, there was economic development in the state. Um, there was now this new organization funded. Um, how did that work out? I mean, were you welcomed in this community? How do you reach out to the existing uh, kind of architecture of economic development institutions in the state? I would say a short answer to that is no, we weren't welcomed. And I don't know if any of you know who Darla Moore is, but she is a, uh, a, a finance. She was a New York City financier that married Richard Richard Rainwater, who's a big Texas guy, and uh, she's from Lake City, South Carolina. Um, uh, she uh, came back to the state, made a big investment in the business school, got involved in everything. Uh, she was on the cover of Fortune magazine, and I think the title was The Toughest Babe in Business. Uh, you know, sometimes they use other words. Uh, but Darla, uh, Darla stood up in front of 800 people after this. Uh, you know, this is down in South Carolina. You know, we had just had Harvard do this big strategic plan, and, and Darla Moore with her southern drawl stood up there in front of uh, the leadership of the state and said, you've been doing this all wrong. And anybody who's in traditional economic development is going to be a dinosaur in five years. And so we got, uh, we had a good leader in, in Darla, but that was not the right way to start. And we, we started off on the wrong foot. And we've, we've, uh, we've made a lot of progress since then. Um, uh, but the, the short answer is no, we were not accepted. We, we've been kind of fighting ourselves to relevancy. Right. Well, she certainly is an imposing uh, personality. So it's interesting to hear that story and how do you find your way into uh, a space that's not white, there, there, where there are always uh, a lot of institutions. Now let's turn to uh, Jennifer Zeller and uh, hear a little bit about what you do now and what you've done before in terms of economic development in Georgia. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Jennifer Zeller, and I'm Director of Research for Georgia Power. I'm delighted to speak among the, um, these esteemed panel and uh, hear about RTP and the success of South Carolina. And certainly, we're always trying to follow in RTP's footsteps and what a, a great thing they've done over in North Carolina. And we're starting to emerge with our biomedical um, big wins here when we won Baxter. So we're trying to learn a lot about what they did and how they did it, because I think we're in, in for some explosive growth. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how Georgia Power does what they do and the tools we use. And then I want to talk about um, just kind of the collaborative approach we do for clustering. And when I say collaborative, I'm talking about tools. So I'm really going to talk about how the tools interplay with each other and how we use that to help communities. I'm not going to talk so much about 
how we uh, help economic development, but some of it is economic development related because I really thought Leanne and Neil were going to talk about that, which they did. So I didn't want to talk about similar things. So I, what I won't talk about is how we've positioned the state along with the Georgia Department of Economic Development to look at our target, targeted cluster initiatives. And we do have some reports online, our competitive, competitiveness report that we establish incentives with, but we look at targets on the economic development side every year. And we do that in collaboration with the chambers, we do that in collaboration with state partners, Department of Community Affairs, and the Department of Economic Development to make sure we're on the right footing. We've heard a lot about you know, reviewing, seeing if these things fit, abandoning things that perhaps don't fit, or looking at the wider cluster and see that perhaps some things under that cluster are not working anymore, and there's a, there's a, a new drive in that subcluster. So I'm going to start off showing you, or talking about what is Georgia Power doing in community and economic development. So that's probably the most common question I get. And as soon as someone meets me, they start talking about, you know, megawatts and electricity. And, and what's really strange is I don't really do much of that at all. And although I'd love to talk about consumption electricity and, and all the new technologies that are going on with smart grid, totally into that, but what we do really is we're almost an external affairs organization for community and economic development. And why is Georgia Power in this game? It all started in 1927 when our president at the time, President Arkwright, thought we should be a citizen wherever we serve. And that motto is on everything at Georgia Power to this day. He felt that Georgia Power needs to help communities grow within our state as well, promote, as, well as promoting growth to the state. So the community development side, creating a better product so we can have economic development, be able to sell the state. So we've been doing this for this for, for a very long time. And how are we different? We're not really different so much, but we are a great partner and we provide a lot of tools that wouldn't be the state wouldn't have otherwise. For example, we have a whole engineering department. I'm not sure how many people in economic development actually have in, civil engineers on staff. But when Kia came to town, we were able to map out the entire Kia plant site and show them exactly how the interstate was going to fit in, and we could tell them how much it was going to cost to move dirt. So that's not the plans they actually built on, but the plans look really close to what we drew. So this is just an example of how we're a little bit different and we're able to offer the services that we already have at Georgia Power to help bring um, growth to the state. And this is a, I know you can't see in this, and I apologize for how small this is, but this is our tools. So you see a lot of bullets, and that's all I want you to see. We have a lot of tools that we use, and workforce analytics is the first gray box that you see, and the Harvard Cluster Mapping Project is in that box, as well as career builder, as well as economic modeling specialists, and all these workforce analytics tools that we use. The reason that workforce analytics is first is because site consultants tell us that basically Skilled talent, availability of skilled talent is the number one concern for prospects today. So the annual um, survey of site consultants puts them at number one. So cost, I think it's number one is cost, and number three is availability of skilled talent. I think highway accessibility or accessibility is number two. But talent used to be in the number six or seven spot about four years ago. So skilled talent is at... Is, is the center of everything, and that really lends itself to cluster development, understanding those skill sets that feed into cluster development. We use a lot of other tools that are on there as well. And in collaboration, they really tell a good story. I'm going to give you a couple examples of how we've used some cluster development on the community development side. And some of them are very rudimentary. But I don't know if any of you have a lot of new cities that are propping up in your region. Everyone wants to be their own city. Maybe it's just an Atlanta problem. I don't know. But everywhere I turn, there's a new city. And they come to us and they say, help us figure out, you know, we're trying to, we really want to get in the game. We want to get incentives behind where we're going. And we want to be the number one city in the, in the Atlanta market and help us figure out all the data and put it together so we can, you know, we can really develop that strategy and be able to really be intelligent about everything. So we met with the city of Brookhaven, and what this is is a map of top employers. And we started from the beginning. Here are your top employers, and these are, this is what they're in, IT, telecom, business and finance. You've got some health care. You've got some uh, university presence. And, and then we looked over the, their clusters, and it was telling a similar story, the fact that business and finance was their largest cluster, but it really wasn't a very big becoming more specialized in nation. It wasn't really an emerging cluster. Education and university were. 
And then we looked at where the employment was going to come in from that business and finance sector, and it was the largest cluster. But just to give you an idea, the, what I wanted them to say is, okay, that's great. Now, can we look at a bigger region? What do my neighbors have? Yes, that's what I want you to ask. So you, you can understand and get beyond those boundaries of Brookhaven, and we can understand how we can have a regional plan. So we start from small steps, try to get them to think bigger, and how they impact other areas around them. But that takes them to kind of take that foot step forward. Another region that leading to a larger initiative is Metro South. When I say Metro South, that's the area just south of the airport. So that, air, that area has not grown the way North Metro Atlanta has grown. They've had a lot of challenges. They have a lot of things that they were overcome. Income levels are not that great. Poverty levels or just have not gotten the kind of job, the kind of high quality jobs that the North side has gotten. So we, um, we showed them a lot of data that was very basic, some po where they are with population growth, with income, median age, educational attainment, SAT, dropout rates, showed them the basics of where their region was look what their region looked like on a five-year horizon using Metro Atlanta and Georgia as a comparison. And then we moved on and looked at their regional employment trends, which were quite good, actually. And then we looked at their commuting patterns. And the reason I'm telling you all of this about what we look at, because I think it all lends itself to a better story of how to develop that strategy along with cluster analysis. So we learned that there, a lot of people were leaving that area to work. Not a big surprise there, but they could actually see that they were getting some inflows as well. And that's a picture of their labor shed where workers live and residents work. So really got a feel for their movement in and out commute within the region. Shown their top employers and the emergence of who was coming to town. They just gained Porsche North American headquarters and they've got Delta headquarters. So they really could see where they're going to have some really big opportunities in the business and finance area that they, they weren't really aware of. And transportation logistics is their largest cluster. And that's the big red dot there for that Metro South region. But they also could see that business finance was a huge cluster, almost as large as transportation logistics, not almost as large, but equal growth opportunity in that region. I'm going to flip through. This is just their concentration of jobs by zip codes and their earnings, where they're coming from. We also looked at the higher education concentration. So when you think of that Metro South region, what kind of um, technical school graduates were coming, were going to be feeding the pipeline to those top clusters? Where were they, where were they going to keep that momentum going for that transportation, logistics, and business and finance cluster? And I'm happy to report that all this research, and I just showed you a couple samples, led to this Aerotropolis concept that they're working on right now in, co in collaboration with a lot of different partners. So Dr. John Casarda is the, the, that's his mantra, that's his design, that's his vision for Aerotropolis. And right now that Metro South is in a five-county coordinated effort to create this kind of Aerotropolis concept around the busiest airport in the world. And that's Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. So the, the Aerotropolis concept is a 30 to 35 minute drive time concept. And that's the region that we're looking at. We have a lot of different partners, including the Atlanta Regional Commission, which is a 10 county planning unit. We're involved. The Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce and local chambers are involved. The government is involved. Georgia Tech is helping us with that. So we have University, Delta Airlines, as well as Porsche with their new North American headquarters that's in the corner of that big U-shaped design. They're going to have training center, museum. Um, it's it's going to be just an amazing facility right there at the airport. So if you want a Porsche, you can come to Hartsfield Jackson Airport. They will escort you and you can go and do a test drive around their 1.6 mile track. And even Delta's got into the game. There's a little picture up there of a Porsche Cayenne on our tarmac. You say, what, what is that? So if you're a top Delta flyer, you might be surprised one time to get off the plane and be escorted to your other plane without actually coming into our terminal. So that's a new program. They're not really talking about it too much, but if you have a tight connection, they're looking for those folks and those, those top folks to handhold. So I'm hoping that happens to me one day. It's more like my husband because he's never home and he's always flying. But. Um, so this is just an example of a regional collaboration effort, multi-jurisdictional, multi-discipline. It's kind of a blueprint approach for moving forward from all of this cluster analysis. Some challenges with cluster effectiveness I'll just touch on briefly. 
timely data. I mean, if you've got an emerging cluster because Baxter moves to town with 1,500 jobs and it's changing the dynamics of a five-county area, it's not going to be reflected in the cluster data probably for many years. So that's kind of that's kind of a real difficulty with the communities. Unless they're using it in collaboration with all these other tools that I'm talking about to really make sure they're understanding their community the best way. Now, I'll end with, uh, and I'll, I'll, I have this great quote from Bruce Katz, Collaborate to Compete. And I'll have to say that I wasn't sure, that I, I wasn't aware that this was a huge theme, so I'm glad that it's here, um, that I hit the target here. But, you know, his idea of collaboration to compete among many organizations, and this is from his Metro Revolution report. If you haven't read, read it, read it. It's fantastic. And he was talking about basically how organizations have to get together and create these metro regions of the global future, um, and that's what's going to push regions into the future. So, and that's the only way you can do it, and that's everything we're talking about today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Very much. Well, this was extremely interested, and uh, obviously, I'm already looking forward to connecting with the Cayenne. Um, and I know Mark Moore, who I see in the audience, will be happy to report back to Bruce Katz that uh, uh, there are avid readers of his report here and the work that Brookings is, Brookings is doing. So very quickly, I mean, we're, we're, we're short of time, but I think one of the issues that you mentioned is, is what's the right region? And, you know, how do you look at, look at that? Um, often neighboring uh, uh, communities have similar patterns and are connected to your city. You worked previously at the uh, Atlanta cham uh, Chamber. Is it now easier... Uh, at, uh, at Georgia Energy because you have a kind of a broader kind of uh, scope to be able to define the right region for your work? I think so. I mean, I think you can be confined by a geography. So, you know, Metro Atlanta is, has one of the most counties in the nation. There are 29 counties now. And, you know, Atlanta, if there's a weakness for Atlanta, it's fragmented. And it's very hard, and that means more partners to collaborate, right? So if you've got five counties in what would have been a Detroit Count one county, that's how many more players that you have to convince this is the right way to go. And so that's a challenge that we have. In the Metroland Chamber, I was doing some cluster work when I was there, um, but I like the approach of a, a data-driven cluster versus you your have to work within the geography. So it makes much more sense. It's an interesting trade-off, you know, the facts on the, uh, on the one side, the economic reality, on the other side, the political instruments that are often aligned and the players, uh, players that you have, so certainly something uh, to keep in mind. Here, how the chamber is trying to work in using clusters. Christine, thank you. And thanks also to the other panelists as well for their uh, illuminations. I, th I find a lot of common themes uh, emerging as I listen to the presentations, and so let me go through uh, some of those uh, in my brief time. What I'm going to do is just give a brief overview of the chamber and then drill down a little bit into the clusters that we see around the Detroit region, which we refer to roughly, not in terms of political jurisdictions, but in terms of economic regions. Uh, and then I'm going to give a couple of examples of how we use the cluster data, which we've gained mostly from the mapping project, but from other sources as well, to... Uh, to guide our policy recommendations, to guide our program strategy and tactics, uh, and just to inform generally how we view what we're doing and how we're doing it in the Detroit region. Um, first, a couple of words about the chamber. We are historically a, uh, a traditional chamber of commerce. We're going to be 100 years old next year. Uh, so that brings to mind immediately the theme that we've been talking about, that as an organization of any type, you need to evolve or you can, began to, you can begin to liquidate. Um, how we have evolved over the years is by redefining our four strategic priorities to align with what we believe the region needs. So it's region first at the chamber. And those four strategic priorities that you see listed at the bottom of the slide are economic development, regional collaboration, education reform, and value to our members in the implementation of all of those programs. For those of you who were here at the session yesterday, Jim Frierson had some very, very appropriate comments about how chambers need to evolve to meet the, uh, the needs of their region and their members. Basically, chambers used to be membership organizations that promoted networking opportunities. In a society today where the cost of information approaches zero, 
that, that, that means that chambers have a limited opportunity, a more limited opportunity, to promote their value uh, through that type of mechanism. So you see the programs that we've, uh, that we've emphasized. Um, our market, uh, how do we define our region? Detroit uh, is obviously a calling card. It is our main urban metropolis area. Uh, it, is, it is the brand equity. It's the reputation. But we also serve at the chamber the 11 counties that comprise southeast Michigan. And so we always talk about regions in terms of collaboration programs and messaging. But we also obviously want to align our regional priorities with that of the state. And so we've made a very, very conscious effort to coordinate with uh, the governor's office and the state economic development authorities. Taking a look at the clusters that are currently prominent in the region, we use the, lo the location quotient measure that the mapping project uses. If you have a location quotient over 1.0, you have greater than the national average of economic assets for that particular sector. And what you're looking at here is essentially an outline of the automobile supply chain. You have uh, at the far left of the graph a 7.6 location quotient for the automotive sector supported by various uh, sectors or clusters, metal manufacturing, production technology, power generation and transmission, uh, and then logistics, trade distribution and logistics, uh, transportation distribution and logistics, all of which have location quotients over one. And that is driven by the history of the automotive sector. So that's what's prominent today. What you see in terms of emerging clusters, and we measure this data as well, are some very interesting trends in terms of whether and how the regional economy in southeast Michigan can begin to diversify itself. So what's, what's up and coming, if you will? All of these location quotients are less than 1.0, but show significant growth patterns moving forward. Distribution services publication and printing, which is uh, the dissemination of information. Education and knowledge creation is an emerging cluster. Analytical instruments as well. So advanced manufacturing technology and the measurement of precision manufacturing tools uh, and precision manufacturing end products is a growth sector for our region as well. So the basic point here is that for the economic development programs that we have at the chamber, the cluster is, has been, and this comes from my EDA days working with the Institute with Professor Porter and Professor Kettles, we use the cluster as the basic unit of our regional economic analysis. For programs such as the traditional uh, economic development model of business attraction, we look at those particular clusters and we work with companies in the cluster to identify gaps. And then we target companies who can fill those gaps as part of our business attraction programs. If we look at incentive structures and we're working with the state and counties and municipalities to devise incentive programs, credits, subsidies, whatever kind of incentive you would like, we work to look at the location quotient of the particular sector first. If a sector has a low or stagnant location quotient, that argues against uh, devoting or designing incentive programs to that particular sector. Those of you who are familiar with Michigan will recognize that uh, at the beginning of the Snyder uh, administration, Governor Snyder's administration in 2011, he eliminated a one plus billion dollar program of film production subsidies. And he did so largely on the basis of the fact that the location quotient for that sector was remarkably low. Uh, that was a very politically controversial move on his part, but he stands by it. And basically, uh, he, he, his, his logic was essentially that the film production sector in Michigan is not organically growing and not organically sustainable. And so as a tool to balance the budget and also rationalize government services to business, he eliminated those subsidies. Politically unpopular, economically rational. And then we use clusters and cluster data to figure out what's next. Uh, and here's how 
cluster data inform what we think about when we're designing our programs and implementing them. In terms of the automotive sector, the question that Christian asked uh, at the beginning was whether the decline of the auto sector had something to do, had an influence on Detroit's current municipal bankruptcy, or whether uh, it is part of the recovery that's going on. The answer to those questions is yes and yes. Uh, So we basically look at that cluster data to define What kind of resources do we put into promoting, retaining, and growing the auto sector? And how can we use that sector to diversify the economy? And the answer is we can do so in many, many ways. In terms of logistics, also a a prominent cluster in the region, the question is uh, what do we do to grow the trade capacity of the region and the export potential of the region? What infrastructure then do we need to emphasize and build and improve to improve that trade capacity? Detroit is the fourth largest metropolitan statistical area in terms of exports in this country. New York is first, LA is second, Houston is third, and fourth comes Detroit. So we have performance in the export sector, and the question is, how do we build on it? And then food, one of the tracks of the conference, we build on because it is a specific redevelopment strategy that is existing and growing in the city of Detroit. And we can talk a little bit more about that in the discussion, how food is something that in general, whether it's in terms of um, growth, production, processing, and distribution and retail is something that does not lend itself to great, to great levels of outsourcing and how it is a prominent job creator uh, when you have a city like Detroit that is trying to redevelop from extreme levels of economic and financial distress. With that, um, there are a couple of programs that we've used that cut across sectors Um, Both of these programs, the Interstate Program, which is part of the Jobs and Innovation Accelerator Challenge, and Pure Michigan Business Connect either are or were funded by EDA uh, to begin with, and they have both proven extremely effective in developing cross-sectoral clusters. I know that departs from our traditional definition of what a cluster involves, but we've used cluster theory and cluster mapping to grow both of these programs into remarkable opportunities uh, for procurement, for the Michigan supply base, and also for the advanced manufacturing sector. Uh, With that, I'm going to sit down and uh, get to the discussion and look forward to answering the questions. But I have one question for all four of you, and maybe we'll start and and work our way uh, 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 through, through the group. And that is, it seems to be that for a regional organization, one of the key challenges with clusters is that it forces you to focus. It forces you to select, and by implication, it also forces you to say, well, I'm not going to work with you. I'm not going to give my attention to you. I'm going to work with these others. How do you balance that politically? Uh, How do you make sure that that is sustainable? And how do you select who you're going to uh, uh, work with? Leanne, if you want to give that a try as a first. So we don't look at it as picking winners as much as nurturing success and accelerating success. And we, we do that um, actually by looking at the numbers, um, which many have been discussed here, of where our universities are working, where our nonprofits are working, and where we're seeing the greatest movements in the economy. We target resources towards nurturing that success and accelerating that growth. Um, so we don't really look at it as picking winners as much as recognizing and acknowledging competitive strengths and leveraging them. Right. I think my, my Finnish friends always talked it's, uh, it's not about creating winners, it's about backing winners, exactly right, what you exactly. just said. Uh, reacting to market signals rather than trying to work uh, against the market. That's right. Yeah, what was the situation in South Carolina? That's an interesting, um, just trying to think through some specific examples. Uh, certainly when you work with traditional economic developers that are focused on recruiting, in my experience, they want to be able to recruit anybody who will come. So they don't want to be limited to these eight sectors or these six sectors. If they do, then they're, uh, they're, they're unwilling to uh, – they want to talk about advanced manufacturing as, to, as opposed to a, a much uh, or 
IT instead of insurance technology, instead of advanced, you, you know, they, they want to focus on this big, broad, you know, it covers every every sector sort of sort of strategy. So um, uh, I, I think that, you know, we still struggle in South Carolina with the idea, of, with the traditional economic developers over the idea of focusing. I think it makes a lot of sense. Somebody mentioned... Um, uh, the, you know, the governor of New Jersey, I mean, to me, that makes sense. I mean, to me, clusters are all about knowing what you're get at, good at and focusing workforce development and other sorts of incentives and programs there. That makes sense to me. But it's difficult. Yes. You know, the, the, the principle is easy. The reality often much more much more difficult to, uh, uh, to implement. Jennifer, Georgia, where was the situation? I mean, Neil's exactly right. I mean, I, I get more advanced manufacturing questions than any other industry. If you want to call advanced manufacturing, it's a process, not really an industry. Uh, but we devote, we write about 30 publications a year at Georgia Power that's on our website, selectgeorgia.com, and we devote a lot of time promoting our targets. So I'd say that's how we work with them and make sure the collaboration is there and we talk about all the resources and what's happening in that particular cluster and why Georgia's a great place for it. And do you sometimes get pushback or that sector say, you know, why are we not on your list? We also want to be there. How do you react to that? Not really. I mean, for example, chemicals is something that's becoming larger in our mm -hmm. state and we don't have a piece on that right now, but it doesn't mean we're not working with that industry. All right. So. All right. So one, one of the key lessons from our research is that, that you have to keep this process very open, uh, open both ways, you know, cutting things but also be open to new things that the market process might evolve, but mm -hmm. again, not, not very easy. Benjamin, in Detroit. Well, I, I like your question. Focusing is a great discipline. Um, you know, as an organization, we can't be all things to all people, so we have to pick our spots. Uh, and the data that informs our programs is the basis for rationalizing and mm. justifying to our membership, to the region, to the state, why we're doing what we're doing, why we're building on the assets that we build on. So that's the first thing. The other aspect of, of focusing is that it allows a lot of clarity in terms of organizing the program, um, organizing the, the various actors in the sectors, for example, for logistics. Are you talking about organizing shippers? Are you talking about organizing carriers? Mm. What do you do to bring in governmental authorities mm. as well? Once you're, once you're focused on a particular discipline, then the next step is to figure out who the key players are, and that's the, those, that's the group you want to get around right. the table. Right. So I'm, I'm all for it in terms right. of, uh, right. of right. focusing on the data. I mean, all of you talked a lot about the use of facts, so have fact-driven policy making, and maybe that's some help to at least say, you know, this is not just a political decision, which it always also is, right. but it's a political decision based on, uh, on those facts. Now let's uh, move to uh, the final question about the role of the federal government. Um, and, uh, you know, Benjamin, you talked a little bit about uh, a, p a positive impact that you've seen, that they basically created some new perspectives uh, through those programs. But if you step back a little bit and say, you know, well, more broadly, you know, what should the federal government do so that we can do our job better uh, in this field? And then we'll, we'll go down the line. I think the number one priority of the federal government in advancing this field is immigration reform at this point. We have a, a federal government policy uh, and an infrastructure on immigration reform that is, is decades old based on policy premises and assumptions that, is all, that are also decades old. Uh, I think that those policies and then the infrastructure that supports them need to be revamped to define a new set of assumptions and priorities uh, in this country that talk about global competitiveness, that, that address concerns of homeland uh, security, uh, and then that promote also the types of dynamism, economic and social dynamism, that have made this country great in the past. So it's time to update our immigration infrastructure. So kind of the general business environment is very important to, to the clusters that operate in your region. And, um even more than business, I think it's a societal issue uh, in terms of education, right. in terms of our neighborhoods right. and cities and how they grow. Great. Jennifer? And I would absolutely agree. I mean, uh, I just last week was in a closed door with the mayor on players for immigration change. And uh, there's two national organizations there as well. And there's a really big push towards cities, if, if the feds aren't going to do it, cities are going to take hold of trying to yep. be welcoming because they know that you know, immigrants 
start companies. I mean, far more the non-immigrants. I mean, the data is out there. I mean, Kaufman Report, everything else that you know, that is a springboard to entrepreneurship, and that leads to a lot of our great clusters. So, um, but I would say as a, another another comment is that we just need a lot of data as much as we can get it. I'm a research person, so maybe I'm a little tainted because I can't get enough. Um, but I, I think with our you know on the map projects and different data that's giving us different ways to look at industry concentrations is really lending a lot of intelligence to how do we drive decisions. So I think on the map is a good example um, of some that came out of Cornell, something that really has pushed forward a lot of intelligence to our communities. Great, thank you. Of course, I'll fully subscribe to your view. Yeah. It's unbiased, but we, are, <laughs> we'll, um, you know. But I think your dis- the discussion showed how important data is if you want to drive effective policy making. Neil, well, the first thing you've got to realize is uh, South Carolina has never been a state that liked to get any kind of advice from the federal government. I mean, several hundred years ago. We fired the first shot of the Civil War because we didn't, you know, we, we were unhappy <laughs> with the directive from the federal government. So the, the whole idea of, of federal policy affecting something in the state, I mean, just politically, um, it's just not something that we, that, that we have a lot of discussions about. So, um, and I'm, I'm kind of serious about that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I would say what's been useful uh, to New Carolina, certainly, um, uh, you, you know, the fact that, that EDA, SBA, that these organizations are creating funding programs that are very much focused about building collaborations around industry clusters. I mean, that that's helpful. I mean, you know, sustainable funding is, is always an issue. And so to me, um, uh, th- that has been very helpful uh, to New Carolina. And then, uh, again, I, I still think one of the biggest issues is metrics and, and providing uh, data, you know, coming from the federal level that, that show and rationalize with the data why clusters are significant and how you measure uh, 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 what they can do. Um, I think taking a little bit of a different approach, um, I would like the federal government to continue to invest in research and development at our university levels. Um, Very important, we're home to three tier one research universities. We believe that you can map the history of several of our clusters back to federally funded labs, federally funded research initiatives through our universities as well as through other research entities in our region. One example is the NSF Freedom Center, which is a smart grid research lab at NC State. Um, the federal government funded that to 17 million, and they've turned it into they've leveraged that 17 million to 30 million dollars in private investment to accelerate that research. We would like the federal government to continue to focus on research, continue to fund um, in partnership with the private sector research initiatives that grow our clusters and, of course, create opportunities. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, this is. Uh, uh very concrete, uh, something that we'll take to Matt Erskine uh, uh, later on in the, in the final discussion. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, the, the a core theme was really the general business environment, some of the themes that we also talked about yesterday, not the direct support for any individual cluster or any of your activities. You know, that also plays a role, but it kind of comes... Um, uh, um, comes after these issues. Well, uh, um, a number of great questions here. I think in, 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 uh, because of the time, uh, uh, what I would like you to do is to ask you, there were some specific questions about the research triangle about uh, New Carolina so that you uh, address Leanne and Neil directly after, uh, after the sessions. Uh, great question on metrics of success. How can we really measure the success uh, of clusters? And that's something that we're also uh, are working on in the cluster mapping project, and so maybe we'll engage more on that. And finally, uh, the presentations we will make available on the uh, conference website uh, and also on the TCI website, uh, uh, tci-network.org. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, I truly enjoyed this discussion. I know there's much more uh, uh, to dig into, but I think we've come to a, a number of very interesting insights uh, this morning. Thank you very much and hope to see you again this afternoon with the session that uh, Mark Moore is going to lead on these new federally funded programs. Thank you. Thank you.